So by now, all of us nearly have had that pandemic experience that, that I had and referred to a little bit from Saturday morning where after a gathering, right, it begins with a post or a message. Oh no, I've tested positive. And then more people chime in. Oh, I went there too. I, I tested positive too. And suddenly, you know how it goes. There's a sudden, oh my gosh, was I around that person? Oh, I should have worn more of a mask. Oh no, I have to rush out and get some, get a test. And then you take that test. Oh my gosh, you stick that thing up your nose and you try not to, to die from it. And then you wait out that 15 minutes, just hoping that you will be deemed fit to connect with others safely. And then you see the results, the single pink line of reprieve, the double red line of doom, or if you're me, the, uh... hey, honey, can, can you look, is, it, is this a line? Do you see another line here? Then depending on the results, you either join the cries of relief or uh, the cries of dismay. And it's a lesson, of course, and, the fact that although we're done with the pandemic, the pandemic is not really done with us, but it's also, I think, a lesson in human connection, the mixed bag of rewards and risks that connection brings. You know, we need each other, and sometimes we make each other sick. And the joys and the pains of one and the sicknesses of one often get shared with us all. Now, as United Methodists, we describe ourselves as a connectional church. And then technically that means that, you know, whereas if I am a, a Baptist or perhaps a non-denominational Christian, then, you know, my church is an autonomous entity. You know, we collect the money, we, keep, we own everything. Whereas in the Methodist church, we share our monies and properties and trust. We submit to a system of districts and conferences and superintendents and bishops, but in a deeper sense, I'm going to suggest that this kind of connectivity, dare I say, this kind of communion with God and with each other reflects a bit of the new vision that Reverend Katie references in her sermon title. It's the new vision for connection that's also reflected in Jesus' words that we heard read in today's scripture. I, I, I want you to hear some of those now from Eugene Peterson's adaptive translation. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I love that, the unforced rhythms of grace. And I think our church saw two visions of this grace-filled connectivity just this last week. And the first, you know, was right here, the Vacation Bible School. And we've heard that wonderful song, this little light of mine, so familiar and yet made new through this Vacation Bible School. If you've never participated in Vacation Bible School, or maybe you haven't done it since you were a kid, I encourage you, volunteer if you can next year. It is a lesson in connectivity, intergenerational connectivity, connectivity between the children. Why, we even partnered with two historically African-American Methodist churches this time. I hope we can go further with that. And the children remind us in, this, in their curriculum of the spark, right? The fact that we are all created as special masterpieces of the master creator, that we all have a spark, a little light of the divine in us. And that as Christians, our job is to, whenever we see a neighbor, we are to look for that little light of God in them, to remember that God made them just as precious and valuable as us, and not just with our neighbor, also with the stranger, the immigrant, the least, the lost, the left behind, those who are in prison, those who are in need, even our enemies. We are to look at them, and we are to look for that spark, that little light of God within them. friends. 
in VBS, you see the whole gospel. It's amazing. There it is, right? I could just say, well, thanks, kids. I'm done, but I won't. Uh, the other big event, aside from VBS, of course, was the Louisiana Annual Conference meeting. It was down at the River Center this year. Now, a, a quick crash course in uh, Methodist polity and organizing. We here, here in this church, right, we are a local church or a charge with Reverend Katie. Um, and together with other churches in the area, we are the Baton Rouge District. And uh, together with five other districts, we six districts form the Louisiana Annual Conference presided over by a bishop, uh, Bishop Cynthia Fierro Harvey. Confusingly, we, we use the same name for the organization. You all are right now part of the Louisiana Annual Conference as we do for the event. So every year we have the meeting of the Louisiana Annual Conference. That's what I'm going to be talking about here. For the annual conference meeting last week, gosh, if you've never been, what it is is um, delegates, that is uh, clergy from every church and an equal number of laity, hundreds, right? We all gather together and it's, it's sort of a, Imagine this huge combination of preaching and praise music and high liturgy and prayer and some TED Talks and uh, commun communion, celebrations, memorial. It's like a, a joyful family reunion, lovely and, and precious, despite the fact that it was utterly freezing. Let me tell you, people were bundled up as if it were winter in, the, in high Louisiana summer. And then occasionally, all of this joyfulness shifts into a business meeting with endless financial reports from trustees and then legislative sessions with intricate behind-the-scenes maneuverings and machinations and occasionally there are red-hot emotions and outbursts and hurt feelings. We love each other and we shiver together. We need each other. And then sometimes we kind of make each other sick. The theme for this year's conference was Inspire. But the word I heard most during the last few days was hope. From this passage in Romans 5, we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Hope does not disappoint. I heard that time and time again throughout the conference. And I think they focused so much on that phrase because right now hope for us, this vision for our connectivity seems right now so very fragile, so close to disappointment and shattering. And consider our nation. I read a national poll last week where a little over half of Democrats and Republicans both registered the belief that American democracy will likely fail in our lifetimes. Almost half of those polled believed that civil war was likely. The bonds of connection between us seem ever more frayed, and I wish Friends, I wish things were different in the United Methodist Church, but as you probably know, our denomination's global meetings, that is the general conference of all the annual conferences, usually happens every four years. Those meetings have seemed less like happy family reunions and more like a set of contentious divorce proceedings. The presenting issue concerns whether to allow gays and lesbians, self-avowed practicing homosexuals, to serve as clergy and to marry and get married in our churches. So at this last annual conference, I received my license to preach, along with a group of people that went through the, the, the preaching school along with me. And then I was asked to leave the stage as my cohorts all got churches. And I cannot be appointed or ordained or commissioned because I am gay. There are other issues tectonically sort of beneath that one issue, but that's, that's basically it. How big should the Methodist tent be? And who gets to decide that? 
And right now, friends, we are in a tense sort of waiting period between the last general conference that happened before the pandemic and the next one that's scheduled for 2024. And some churches, through in all annual conferences, but some churches right here in the Louisiana Annual Conference are deciding that they can no longer stay under the big tent of United Methodism. It seems just a bit more inclusive than they would prefer. They are, as the word is, disaffiliating. They're going to other denominations or maybe to deciding to be completely independent. They are breaking that connectivity with the larger body. And of course, if you ask them, they would likely say that the connection was already strained and fractured. And you should know we, we wish each other well, right? We know that God is bigger than any one denomination. They will do great work wherever they go, we trust. But that doesn't mean it isn't quite painful. Our bishop, if you've ever met her, she is kind of a force of nature. She is fearsome and impassioned and powerful, and she is not giving to tears, but she had to stop in the last few days several times to gather herself, to hold herself back as she led us through the process of voting to affirm the separation of long-standing Louisiana congregations from this connection we had enjoyed. I never thought, she said, that I would preside over a disaffiliation. The body gathered at the River Center, the people leading and attending local churches, we all reflected her distress. Several people came up to me and told me just how much they were just vibrating in their seats full of tension and sadness and grief and anger. What grace there was in that time sometimes felt forced. What hope there was, well, sometimes I have to say, sometimes people were honest about not feeling much hope at all. So, and that was just like Thursday and Friday mornings of work. And then, you know, we, we went through a lot of excruciating legislation about disaffiliation. I confess, y'all, I was really worried about the one remaining piece of legislation that we had left. And it was a petition from our denomination's anti-racism task force, I should say our annual conferences anti-racism task force. Because, you know, if you want to cause tension in the church, talk about sexuality. You want to cause a lot of tension. Talk about racism. As several speakers pointed out at the conference, the conference coincides with, well, today, our newest national holiday, Juneteenth. Because Juneteenth is new for many of us who perhaps did not grow up in black cultures, I, I had to learn this myself growing up. Juneteenth commemorates the day in 1865, June 19, 1865, when Major General Gordon Granger of the Union Army finally arrived in Galveston, Texas, to tell the enslaved people there that they were free. Slavery was abolished. The following year, June 19th, Juneteenth, began to be celebrated as a joyful occasion, celebrating black people's victory over slavery, celebrating black life and culture generally. And that's wonderful, but there is a bittersweet note to it, right? Another lesson in the hope and disappointment of human connection. Juneteenth, of course, reminds us, first of all, of the awful breach of human connection that is slavery a wholesale refusal to see an entire population as beloved and equal children of God. The holiday also reminds us how stubborn such ungodly ways of life can be. June 19th, 1865 was two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation. It was two months after the end of the Civil War. Slavery had ended, but slavers simply declined to let enslaved people know. The history of black liberation after this date also speaks to disappointments in hope, places where the vision of all people created equal failed, reconstruction got squashed under decades of Jim Crow segregation and oppression, and the generational and structural effects of those decades and centuries of discrimination, they remain with us, visible as scars and gaps in our churches, our institutions, our human communities today. 
Look at Baton Rouge. Look where our interstates were laid, what neighborhoods they disrupted. Look at the segregation that is still starkly apparent in our neighborhoods. Look at the inequities in our school system, the location of food deserts, the disproportionately black populations in our prisons and jails. Look around you and notice really any space in Baton Rouge that is not at least one third black and ask what factors contribute to making this so. And here I'm not, I'm not actually talking about bad people, bigots. I'm talking about structures and laws and practices that are bigger than any person, any one person. Things that can sometimes seem like that's just the way things are. Or you can look at the districting plan that the Louisiana legislature is now having to reconsider. You know, one third of all Louisianans are black. Yet the original plan, vetoed by the governor, gerrymandered most black voters into only one of our six congressional districts. I don't know the hearts and minds of those who designed and voted for this. I'm not here to declare whether they're racist or not. As the governor argued, as courts have affirmed, the plan itself has undeniably unequal outcomes. It made white representation disproportionately unfairly stronger than black representation. That is simply wrong, a violation of the equality that we are all supposed to enjoy. Okay, now at this point you're probably thinking, you know, John has gone a little off the rails here. If Katie were here, would she be saying this? It's a little political, right? But here's the thing, it's not just me saying this. The criticism of the districting plan, that's the petition that I was worried about. The petition put forward by our annual conference's anti-racism task force. And this is a diverse group of men and women, black, white, brown, liberals, conservatives, moderates, all together. As the task force reminded us at the conference, as Methodists, we believe we cannot live out our commitment to God's way of life and stay out of politics. Politics being different from partisanship, right? We try to avoid partisanship, but politics? There are some Christians, some Christian churches, that teach that, you know, the world is broken, so our job as Christians is to get as many people saved as possible and, you know, individually be good people, and it'll be all be made right in heaven. Now, we Methodists, we certainly celebrate the hope of heaven. We affirm that, of course, we should strive to be good-hearted people. And yet, as Methodists, we reject the idea that the promise of heaven excuses us from working with God and with each other to repair the broken world in the here and now. Our baptismal vows, the same one all of us who are members renew every time someone joins the church, every time someone gets baptized. Those vows ask us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. And we Methodists have not always lived up to this vow. We have shameful moments and failures for which we continue to repent. Methodists have occasionally aligned themselves with the forces of evil. Go Google sometime, Sand Creek Massacre. Denominations like the Amer American Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Zion Church, they exist because white Methodists have in the past cut off black brothers and sisters from equal participation. And we continue on a long path of repentance and repair, even as we look to the ways that we cut off other groups and other people from full participation in our churches. And yet it's not all awful. We Methodists have also been at the forefront of justice issues. In the early 20th century, we fought against child labor. We were at the forefront of the fight to, to stop four-year-olds from being employed in factories and mines. We fought for women's rights, workers' rights, immigrants' rights, justice for poor people, incarcerated people, people in need, people reviled and left out by society at large. Our church boasts heroes of the civil rights movement like Phil Woodland. Black United Methodists in Louisiana are be and beyond are not just surviving, they are thriving, helping the church to become more like Jesus' beloved community. And at this last annual conference on Friday, our anti-racism task force presented a petition to the governor and the Louisiana legislature 
calling for equal representation for black people in Louisiana. I was worried that there would be debate about this. As a motion, it went before the gathered delegates and friends, I held my breath. And then the vote happened with no discussion and it passed with as much unanimity as I have seen in just about any vote. Almost everyone there united in affirming equality, denouncing racial injustice, and yeah, this is a minor step. It's a Methodist asking something of the governor and the legislature, but friends, my fraying hope, my dim vision needed some strengthening. I say it was almost unanimous. A group of delegates, a small group, but visible, voted against the measure. And up jumped a young black man from a nearby table, requesting at the microphone a moment to speak, and shaking with anger and hurt and grief, he poured out his heart, talking about how much it hurt him to see people who profess to be Christians, brothers and sisters, denying him an equal place in the order of society. I would love to know, he said. I invite them to tell me to my face why. And as he spoke, he referenced the underlying tensions simmering and bubbling throughout the conference, throughout our denomination, our frayed connection, the decision by some that the church is just a bit too inclusive. And as he stood weeping, spotlighting this breach of connection, I saw a miracle. First one person, then another. And then another, and Katie was the third person of the whole crowd, surrounded this young man as he spoke and wept, and each one put their hands on him in a silent support and blessing, communicating, you are loved, you belong, we are connected. It was an unforced gesture of grace and love. Suffering produces endurance, and by endurance, I think of the bravery and resilience of that young man, the love he showed in being honest about his pain. Endurance produces character, and by character, it made me think of the Greek word for character, ethos, which is another word for the moral integrity of a community. And the ethos I saw in that moment produced hope it was not world-changing. It was perhaps even fleeting, just a spark, a little light. That little light did not erase the man's pain or our denomination's turmoil. It did not magically repair the world all at once, but neither did that spark of hope disappoint. We need each other. We make each other sick. And sometimes we can heal each other. We can join hands with each other and participate in the repair of this broken world. Christ can renew and redeem our connection, helping us live with and for each other, matching repentance to forgiveness. I don't know what the future, or really just even the next few years, will bring for our church or our nation. In many ways, we are in another painful period of waiting for test results. Are we fit to be connected to one another? The answer is almost always unclear. Do you see this line? It's a mixed bag. Sometimes we are the Good Samaritan helping the neighbor in need, and sometimes we are the people, sometimes, friends, I am the person who crosses to the other side to pass them by. In moments like the one I shared, though, that little spark of hope, I sense a little light that helps me see a bit more clearly the better vision of us as connected, precious children of God, connected to each other in love. On this Juneteenth, then, this day of joyous celebration, somber reflection, and holy endurance, may the Holy Spirit kindle and keep those sparks of hope, this light that we have within us. May we carry that hope into the world of strained connections and renew a better vision for a better future. Amen.